Lord, we love you. We thank you so much uh, for another day uh, in which we can serve you. And uh, we just ask you, Father, in these first few moments of this school day that you speak into our lives through your word, uh, challenge us, and uh, by the help of your Holy Spirit, if there are areas in our life that need to be changed, change us, O oh God, uh, that we might be living our lives more in your glory. We love you, and we thank you for it in your name. Amen. I want to start by, by saying something that I've said almost every week uh, right in the beginning, and that is that I, I believe that God has a plan for each and every one of, of our lives, um, and it's a plan that he wants to see fulfilled. And I believe on the fulfillment to reaching God's plan and dreams and destiny for our life that we will face many challenges and many tests. Um, and and these, these tests that we face um, will, I think, in large part determine uh, if we reach that destiny or maybe the timing in which we reach uh, that destiny. So we've talked about these test in the life of Joseph. We started out with the purpose test. Uh, then we talked about pride. We talked about Joseph in the pit, uh, his position in, in Potiphar's house. And today, uh, we're going to talk about the purity test, the purity test. Um, this is one of the most famous stories uh, in, in the life of Joseph. I say that, but there were sort of lots of famous storylines in, in, uh, in this story that all take us back to our days, early days in Sunday school, right? Um, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of little stories in here that, that we remember, and this is certainly one of the, one of the big ones, beginning in verse 6. Uh, and I did use, I believe, at least the New King James, so... Forgive me if I have some thuses and thous, but I like the, I like the language of it, all right? So, um, thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Now, this is going back to verse 6. I wanted to read it again because it's one of those, it's one of those verses that when you, um, when you see the divisions of, of the Bible, uh, and many times how man broke it down into, into chapters and verses, um, we know that God didn't give it to his, the writers of the Bible in, in chapter and verse, right? And so this is one of those that sometimes I just sort of scratch my head and like, I, I don't know why this verse was divided the way it was, but it was. So verse six, um, Potiphar left all he had in Joseph's hand and he did not know what he had except for the bread, which he ate. It feels like verse six should have ate, uh, ended there. But the end of verse 6 says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. All right? Uh, so that, that tells us something about, about Joseph. Um, and, and that tells us something about the way he looked. Uh, he, he not only was smart, had the favor of God upon him, uh, but he was good looking. All right? <laughs> he was a good looking guy. All right? So verse 7. Uh, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in, in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed to her, to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were inside, that she called him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled, fled and ran outside. Sounds similar to what Paul instructed both the Corinthians and Timothy when he said, Flee flee sexual immorality. This is sort of a living picture of what Joseph did. So Joseph fleed this situation, um, 
and, and his garment was in his hand. It, it's amazing to me when you read through the life of Joseph, you could probably do an entire study on the garments of Joseph, right? Uh, from the coat of many colors to this garment to the garment that Pharaoh put, put upon him. Uh, very, very interesting uh, subject. So th- this, this lesson could really go in a lot of different ways. This is certainly could, could deal with stewardship, for it said that everything that Potiphar had was put into Joseph's hands. And so Joseph, Joseph was a steward for, for Potiphar, much like we are a steward of the things of God. Uh, and, and Joseph stewarded well both his possessions and he stewarded well in his responsibilities as we see his faithfulness uh, to, to, to Potiphar. Um, but we're going to talk about this issue of purity for just a, a few moments, and I realize in a brief time that we won't be able to give full justice to the, to the subject, but I think it is so important for each of us because each of us will face this purity test, and, and, and we must know uh, that our destiny will never, never go to a point beyond our character. Uh, and, and so our, our character, and we've seen this in so many people, that a person's character uh, can, can cut short uh, the destiny upon, upon a person's life. Um, and so let me just give you three thoughts uh, about this idea of purity, uh, because I think we all know this is something God desires of each of us. And this is, this is an area that all of us will certainly be tested at some point in our life. Uh, so first thought, impurity does not begin in the heart. It begins in the eye. Um, verse 7 says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. Lust is empowered by looking, right? David fell with Bathsheba because he looked. Uh, and, and I think there's a great lie of, of the enemy that would tell us about issues of purity in our life um, and, and whatever that issue of, of purity is for you, that you can look, but you can't touch, well, that's, that's really a, a lie of the enemy. My, my, I remember I had a youth pastor that, that shared this with, with us as, as youth. He said, look, you, you can look once, but just don't look twice. Well, well that don't work because I would just take a really, really long first look. <laughs> right? Um, and, and so it, it's important that we understand that, that God, God hasn't given us permission to look upon evil as long as we don't partake of it. Because when we look upon it, it gets in our heart. And if it gets in our heart, eventually it's going to bring forth, bring forth actions. This isn't only within issues of, of, of purity, right? Um, people say, I'm going to look, but I'm not going to buy. Now, when I say people, I mean women, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> um, I, I had this. I had this happen just just last week. We we're in Singapore, and um, my wife said, "Want to go to IKEA?" Look, we're just going to look. I said, "We we really don't have a choice because we didn't pay for check bags, and I'm a little cheap when it comes to that kind of stuff. I'm not going to pay for check bags." All right, so we have two backpacks here. Um, and she reminded me, but Ikea has those big blue bags you can buy for 90 cents. <laughs> so in our, in our trip to Ikea where we were looking and not buying, it seems that that little blue bag filled up very, very quickly. Uh, so by the time that we went to the airport, my backpack wouldn't even zip up. All right, and then we had this, this bag, this Ikea bag that we were just praying would not get thrown on the scales and be weighed because there was no way that it was coming in under the, the kilograms you were allowed for a carry-on bag. So, so there, there's deception in a lot of ways about this idea of looking and not partaking of, right? So um, 
And certainly this is where, this is where uh, the, the sinful thoughts will begin is when we look upon something with our eyes. I, I had a wise, a wise youth pastor, another wise youth pastor that, that used to say, uh, if you see skin, you're going to seek sin. How clever is that, right? Cheesy, I know, but you know what? It stayed with me all these years. We still remember that, right? Um, but, but it's very true. If what you see you will eventually begin to pursue if you allow your eyes to stay focused on it. Uh, let me give you a few scriptures here. Psalm 101.3, I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I will not even look at it. Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are a human's eyes. You can look and say it'll be harmless, but those eyes aren't satisfied. Those eyes aren't satisfied. You're going you're gonna to keep looking, and the longer you look, you're eventually going to buy something, right? Um, Matthew, Matthew 5, Jesus says, hey, whoever looks lustfully, whoever looks lustfully, you've heard what the law of Moses said, that, that uh, you shall not commit adultery, but whoever looks upon a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. Matthew 6, Jesus tells us, the eye is the lamp. Uh, of of the body, Job thirty one th- or thirty one one. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a at a young woman. So impurity impurity begins with our eyes. We have to guard what our eyes are 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 looking at. Uh, secondly, impurity will affect your relationship with God. James one. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is, has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived. Listen, James is writing to the church here. And he tells them, don't be deceived. So if, if James is writing to the church and saying, hey, Satan is out to deceive you, don't you think that we need to make this message in our heart one that is relevant for us as believers and not just for those maybe that we would perceive outside, boy, those heathen, they really need this message. No, the enemy is trying to deceive us. And in this day and time that we live, the enemy is out to deceive us. Us and there are so many outlets. I think more in the right now than in the history of the world. I think the same sins they dealt with in the Bible are the same sins we dealt with now. But the methods that the enemy is getting those to us are the most deceiving that that we have ever seen in the in the world's history. Um, uh, it is it is so important that we that we not allow. Um, that we not allow the enemy to deceive us with sin. Now, I know for, for, many, for many we would say, well, man, that's, that's great, but we have been duped at some point. We have experienced that deception. Uh, what do we do when we have allowed that deception uh, to, to come into our lives? Um, let, I came across this this um, this thought in my in my studies, and I just wanted to share it with you. Sin, sin in the Bible um, has has a couple different connotations. In, in fact, when I say these words, you will you will probably equate them with with sin, right? One, iniquity, iniquity. When it, when I say iniquity, you probably think in some way sin, right? An, another one, transgression. Transgression is is mentioned in the Bible and is and is what we would equate to uh, sin. It is those things that the enemy does to us that entices us um, and entices us that affects our relationship with God. Things that we do that are sinful that get in between us and God. Now, iniquity, Iniquity, when you when you read it in the in the original language, iniquity is actually speaking of the inner motivations of of one's heart. So, those are the those are the things that we that we think about. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, "Hey, if you've even looked lustfully, you you've committed adultery." 
Uh, that's that inner motivation. That is, that is what iniquity is. Transgression is outward movement. Transgression is outward movement. So that is the actual sinful act. All right, transgression is the actual sinful act. It's, it's in English similar to the word trespass, all right? You, you physically went over a boundary. That's what happens when someone trespasses on, in someone's property, right? They physically went over that boundary. And so transgression is, is making that physical leap of, over a boundary. Uh, iniquity is that inner motivation. Now, now some of you perhaps... Um, have have found yourself maybe maybe you haven't even taken that leap of of physically going over that boundary, but you have struggled with the motivations of your of your heart. You you have struggled with a with a wandering eye or a, a lustful heart in in some area of your life. Well, here's 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 a scripture that that I think all of us know, but I think can be applied if you have found yourself with any kind of sin besetting you that has gotten in between your relationship with, with God. But he was wounded for our transgressions. A wound, a wound is on the outside of our, uh, of our skin, right? It is, it is an outward uh, an outward. Um, a cut or, 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 or an outward mark on our skin. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was outwardly hurt for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquity. A bruise is inward bleeding. Uh, what, what, did Jesus, what is iniquity? It's in our inward motivations. Jesus took care of both of those things uh, when, when he went to the cross. And so if you have found yourself in a struggle in any of those, if you have taken that step or you're just struggling with the motivations, know that there is healing in the Lord, and you can come to him uh, with those, and you can lay them down at his feet, uh, and you will find forgiveness and restoration. Thirdly, impurity will affect our future. Sin will keep you from reaching your destiny. Um, when we think of Joseph, he's away from his family. He's powerful in Potiphar's house. Um, he could have very easily have said to himself, who would ever know? I am, I am powerful enough to get everyone out of the house, and they know that they would not tell on me with Potiphar because I have the power I have the power over all of them to, to punish them. But Joseph knew two people would know, him uh, and, and God. And, and we can only imagine what would have happened if Joseph would have failed this test. Um, we probably would not be reading his story um, through the different stages of our life uh, and finding the comfort and encouragement we do if he would have failed this test. Um, the answer, I believe, to, to, over, or to, to passing this test um, is, is found in, in, this, in this passage. I think in, in verse number 9, um, it said of Potiphar's wife, and she talked to Joseph day by day. Day by day she pursued him, which tells us that day by day Joseph was relying upon God for his strength. Let, let me just say this to you as we close out. The enemy doesn't take a day off in your life. And, and all of us will have issues of purity. It might look different. The temptation might look different. Uh, the struggle that we face might be different. But all of us will face some kind of temptation with impurity in our lives or with sin. Uh, it will be a test that all of us will incur, and, and probably most of us will incur daily or weekly or monthly or at least regularly in our life. We will encounter, encounter this because the enemy does not take a day off. And the key for us overcoming these issues of purity is not taking a day off ourselves when it comes to our relationship with God. There's not a day when we can afford not to pray. There's not a day when we can afford not to spend time in his presence. 
Uh, let me close with this scripture because I think it is a powerful challenge and charge uh, for us in the area of purity and especially as it relates to sexual purity. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, I have the right to do anything you say. And boy, I, I've heard this among church people. I have the right to do anything. Sort of the age that we live. If it feels good, do it. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one in flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one in spirit. Now, I know many of us say, well, there's no difference in sins. All sin is sin. But here, here Paul, Paul sort of says... There is a little bit of difference in, in, in sins. Uh, they are looked at a little bit different. Look at this. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And this is my, just my closing challenge to you in all issues, in all issues of purity, whatever that looks like for you in all issues. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we just ask you, even on a subject that is difficult like this, we just pray, Lord, that you would challenge and change us in areas that need to be changed and that you would most of all help us to honor you with our bodies and in all that we do, let us live in purity. We love you and thank you for it in your name. Amen. Bless you guys.